Hello, hello. Greetings, everybody. Kevin Townley here with my cat, Joanne. Hopefully that don't get any butt shots, but you never know. I'm gonna call up our special guest today. Uh, it's so nice to be with you. Well, my name's Kevin Townley. I will be uh, kidnapping Susan's Instagram account for today, yes. Oh my God, my cat just drooled everywhere. Hi, Joan. An excitement to see Nula. Yeah. Hi, Joan. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Nula. So here, oh my God, exciting. Here we are. Uh, we are live on Susan Piver's Instagram uh, here with my cat, Joanne, but the guest of honor is the fabulous artist, Nula Clark, who is uh, Zooming in live all the way from County Mayo, Ireland. That was just my doorbell. Don't be scared. Um, so this is our last uh, in a series of conversations with artists that are featured in my book, Look, 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 Look Again, Buddhist Wisdom Reflected in 26 Artists, and we save the best for last. Uh, Nula is a dear friend and uh, an incredible artist, and she's featured in my book in the chapter called Karma. So the book just briefly is about what are called the five wisdom energies or five Buddha families in uh, Himalayan Buddhist tradition. Uh, and the idea is that in these five kind of <clears throat> areas of the mind, we find different uh, difficult emotions as well as wisdom. And the karma family uh, is karma means action it's a word that many of us know and probably use willy-nilly uh, but karma means action in sanskrit and it is the realm of jealousy competition one-upsmanship uh compare and despair and also uh, what is called all accomplishing wisdom so uh the 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 painting that we use or feature in the and the book is called Aideen's Dream, number one. And uh, I'll, I'll post an image of that on, on the feed uh, presently. In fact, it's on Susan's page and I'll put it on my page so you can see it. Uh, and if you have the book, you can see it already. But without further ado, uh, I'm here to chat with Nula. So Nula, as you're well aware, in, in uh, the book, we, uh, your section is, is an interview. It was a conversation we had over the summer and one of the things that uh, kind of stayed with me, oh, I'm to my notes just in case. <laughs> we were talking about um, abstract art and the difference between uh, pictorial abstraction and kind of healing abstraction or an art object which is a thing in itself, it's not representing some other thing, but it is itself a healing object. And I and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and this is specifically, we've been talking about the artist Hilma off Clint, and you'd said that you feel one of the challenges is that it's like up here uh, in sort of linear traditional western art history there's like a progression of movements and this leads to that and that leads to that and so on and so forth and what you kind of astutely observed about artists like Hilma off Clint uh, is that there's a there's a missing category and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that missing category is and how uh, and the idea of art as a healing object Right in at the deep end, Kevin. Sorry. <laughs> we can start off with what, why did you stop painting? Why did you start painting? Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, I have a bit of a cold as well, so I'm, I'm a little croaky. Uh, no, um, yeah, Hilma, um, 
you know, there, there's talk of her being a, an abstractionist, you know, and that, and that we need to amend history to put her in before Kandinsky. But um, when I look at her work, it seems like it's, it's not being made for the, for exactly the same reasons that Kandinsky's is being made. Um, I think with her work, she, like, um, say, W.B. Yeats, when he received the, the information from the medium, you know, she received the information from somewhere else. And then this is a, is a, is a diagram or a description of it. And, and the fact that it comes out as abstract um, is probably a function of, of what that information is and how it can most easily be digested. But that if, it, if that information came in another way, maybe it wouldn't necessarily need to be abstract. Um, so, so, so that's why maybe there's a problem putting her in before Kandinsky, but don't take my word for it. Um, you know, I'm just thinking that she's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different abstractionists, just like there's all sorts of different, you know, fingerprints of people. You know, I do it for a different reason than somebody who's interested in, um, you know, a more formal um, objectness of, something that relates to art history. My work is, is, is in a lineage, but I'm not sure that it directly relates to art history or other abstractionists that went before me. Um, yeah, and the healing part, it's something I'm exploring at the moment. I've, I have made work specifically to deal with um, situations in my life and found that um, there has been a transformation through making the work that by the end of a body of work, I, I've become transformed, I've become a different, different being. And, um, and so I wonder, could the work have that power for somebody else? You know, so at the moment, I'm, I'm in the middle of research has just been getting huger and huger, you know, um, about that very subject, just to know how color and movement comes into the in through the eyes and down through the body and then what can potentially happen. So, yeah. Yeah, when we last spoke, uh, I think you were about to do a workshop with a, uh, like a, a neuro neuroscientist or a, something like that. We did a workshop with a physicist. A physicist. And then, I know it started. Yeah, and then some, some things have been delayed because of COVID, you know, and, and there's there's practical things I've wanted to do that I haven't been able to do with people. So, so yeah, no, it's ongoing. I'm, I'm very much in the reading phase. I'm not hugely scientifically minded, so it takes a long time. My brain has been very taxed. I'm learning a lot. But maybe it's working to... Yeah. I, what, one thing we, we talked about in the, in the interview that's in the book is, you know, I feel that my personal creative process is very intuitive. And if I kind of know too much about like, I don't really know about like what the effect will be on somebody or even what effect I want it to have. Uh, and, and I wonder like, cause I feel, I feel like if I do know too much and this just might be like some sort of weird anti-intellectual streak in me, I don't know. Uh, I, I feel like if I know too much about the mechanics of my creative process, then I'm gonna like screw it up or something. Uh, or I'll be kind of like outside of it somewhat and out of sync with, with the process. So I'm, I'm curious if, uh, since we've spoken, as you've done more research, do you feel that as you learn more about the sort of workaday functionality of how the brain receives and processes visual images and colors and the, how that is translated into nerve impulses or who knows what, do you feel that that has changed your approach to how you paint or do you feel that it's kind of more like taking a, an an Advil, like you, it's doing what it's going to do and you don't need to know how your body is like metabolizing the information. Uh, how, how is it affecting your process or work? Well, um, the body is extraordinary. You know, that, I mean, our, 
I mean, our retinas are actually brain material. You know, that's, it's, you know, there's, our brains are actually on the outsides. You know, they're facing the world. You know, the more I learn, the more complicated it gets, the more amazing it gets, the more fascinating it gets. Um, and, and I think what it's, what it's doing is it's desolidifying my work. It's, it's, the work is becoming more amorphous, more abstract. Um, so maybe the opposite of what you think might have happened by knowing more. I feel like I, I feel like I know less just because there's so much to know and, and I'm even more amazed. So, um, so the work really feels at the moment, like it's like it, like it's very experimental and there, there are no, there are no answers um, to things. And I'm, and I'm like, just today I was working and it, it's limitless what, what can go on in a, in a, in a painting, you know, it, you can go any direction at any time. And, um, and it, it's always been that way for me, I suppose. Um, it's, I, I, I love the point where um, maybe I, I'm doing something new, doing something I haven't done before. And that, that point of like, not really recognizing it. And then therefore not really knowing is it good or not, you know, because you don't, you, you don't, you, I've never seen it before, so I don't know if it's if it's a good thing or not a good thing. And then having to wait and spend time um, to see uh, is this going to survive? Is this going to last? Is this going to lead to something? Is this like an opening into something else? Uh, it's the it's the best part of being a painter, I think. It's is that not not, not knowing and 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 moving to the next thing. But um, I don't know. Maybe it's a function of uh, like, you know, I became a painter, so I wouldn't have to do this kind of thing, you know, like show my face, you know, <laughs> like you, your work, you have to show your, you know, you're doing it in front of people. So maybe, so maybe it's a good thing that you're not examining every moment of it, because then maybe you're, you get out of yourself, but I can do my work before the audience, you know, um, the audience is much less defined. It's, you know, whatever spirits or whatever companions you have in the in the studio however much we're connected you know um if we are all connected then everybody's in the studio with me but you can kind of act like they're not and um i have time you know when i'm working um so maybe that's the difference i don't know that that actually makes some sense here i'm gonna by the way and this is a a printout of your painting so Sorry, it's on laser jet ink, which is probably making your eyeballs curl no. over. But what a fabulous image this is. This is called Adine's Dream, number one. It's of a of a series. And um, yeah, what you're saying... I, oh, please, go on. No, I mean, you've talked about um, what you have to go through when dealing with each of these um, families. So I'm... Um, I'm wondering what you had to go through when you were dealing with the karma family, you know, personally, when you were writing the, the section in the book. Yes. Well, it was, it was very hard. Um, weirdly, I, I, I told, I mentioned that, you know, I kind of not through, through no fault of my own kind of, you go into this subject matter or these energies and you kind of start to just sort of take on or those qualities in you start to step forward. And so in my own little way, I kind of like had my confused spaced out period and my crabby angry period. And then my feeling of like total self aggrandizement, like this is going to be the best book ever. Look at everybody. And then like, then feeling I had nothing to hold on to and like grasping desperately. And so then by the time I got to karma, which is the end of the book, I was like, oh, well, you know, karma is about like speed and efficiency. So I'm just going to like write really short little things and just be over with it. I'll be done with it. Mm -hmm. And then weirdly, I got Bell's palsy just as I started writing this. I'm, you know, it's mostly better now. Um, and so I went to, <clears throat> I went to an acupuncturist to, you know, 
I mean, I took the, me you know, the medicine the doctor said to take, but I also went to the acupuncturist and she said, oh yes, yeah, so that's, it's interesting. Bell's palsy, you know, is um, in Chinese medicine has to do with uh, wind. Well, wind is also the element of karma family. And I was like, and I mentioned- Which we have a lot of today. We have, it's a completely karma day here today, so. Very windy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so I mentioned that to her just sort of like as a funny coincidence. And she was like, uh, that's not a coincidence. <laughs> I was like, I guess like the, oh, the Amoga City Buddha is like kind of annoyed. She's like, he might be. So you should talk to him or include that in your practice in some way. And I was like, duh, <laughs> okay. So weirdly, like my attempt to like speed through it and like be done with it actually reversed on itself and it really forced me to slow down and uh be in the environment of of speed and agitation and, and the feeling of needing to be done yesterday or whatever uh but it has its own priorities these energies have their own priorities and you know you don't really get to like tell them how to work <laughs> you know it's quite the other way around um and so it's, it's quite interesting because the the myth um ad the the story um she um the, you know a man who was married fell in love with her and his wife uh didn't like this so she turned her into a fly and then the this fly then sat on the man's shoulder and the man didn't mind and so then the wife created a wind that Blew her out to sea for seven years, and the only place she could land was on a rock, you know. And she came back, and she got blown out to sea again for another seven years. So there's there's this this um this painting that you showed is has it's it's in the summertime here. There's this gorgeous thing that happens where the sun is shining, and Aideen's a, a sun goddess, um. And it's green here in Ireland. So I, I just find it very interesting that you picked this because there's a lot of, um, you know, overlaps. But the sun shines on a hill and then when the cloud passes by, there's beautiful um, shadow. That, um, that, uh, I'm just trying to call it. And the shadow on the hill uh, just passes over and creates this lovely undulating dark area so that's what that so that's what that work is about but um i just found it fascinating that that you would have picked that painting with so many parallels to the the greenness and the windness and that were you aware of all of that when you chose that work or not in the least okay. i a funny the funny thing about your work as i i, I knew immediately when I <clears throat> set out on this project, uh, I was talking to Crystal Gondrew, who's the editor and our mutual friend and uh, the publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, well, we have to include Nula. And she's like, oh, definitely, no, no question. But then we were like, but which section could she go in? And then we were like, well, we looked at all of the work that you had online and we were kind of like, she could kind of go in any of the sections. There is, there, is a mer mercurial quality in your in your work and so i couldn't quite decide and then i i knew that i would include you but wasn't concerned so much about where it would show up and then i was like oh i need a i need somebody for karma i, guess, I was like i guess we can like put nula we'll we'll wedge her in there <laughs> uh which was actually not probably like the last of the five that i would have associated with you quite honestly like I really, like a lot of your work, I feel is very Vajra or Buddha, or you have those fabulous, like uh, ovular red paintings. I was like, oh, she's definitely a, going in Padma. But then I was like, okay, well, I guess maybe something with some green, <laughs> which is like hard <laughs> to find in your work. Uh, yeah, we we talked a little bit. And so then I kind of like oh zeroed in on this one. I was like, well, this, this feels mm -hmm. right. And it wasn't until after 
I had asked you if we could include that one. And I think your response was like, that one? I'm so okay if you want to. Uh, that I then started doing sort of research into what the title meant and then all of this stuff about jealousy and movement and the way like that it totally happened mm -hmm. i don't know if it was coincidentally but it revealed itself after the fact so it was quite yeah. fortuitous <laughs> yeah 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 those irish stories are amazing this the you know i was looking at it again today and um just how these women can have all these attributes these you know, there's reincarnation, there's transformation, there's strength at every, at every age, you know. Um, like Aideen has this ability to um, be very loving and faithful and true and attractive, like a sun, like a sun goddess should be attractive, you know. And then this, this wife, uh, you know, who we might assume is older, has this huge strength to like, you know, forge her way forward, you know, into like, you know, I am not going to let this, this woman take over my life, you know, and blow her out to sea. I mean, I just, I love those Irish stories. And, um, but that painting um, is, you know, it's a landscape painting. And it, those are the things I do just for um, kind of entertainment or fun or to take a break from the other work that I do. Um, it's because I'm surrounded by landscape here, sort of imbued with it. And Alice is saying, didn't someone swallow it? They did, yes, yes, they did. Somebody swallowed Aideen. So, um, she fell it was into a wife... tear, right? Yeah, no, it was the wife of um, another king um, swallowed her. She became pregnant. Aideen was born again um, and then was, um, you know, grew up and didn't remember her previous life. But the man who'd fallen in love with her found a way back to her, you know. So really, just, just all the circularity, it's, it's an amazing story, um, one of the many. Um, but yeah, no, those paintings are, because uh, I'm surrounded by landscape, and so you just, I just can't help dealing with it sometimes. You know, just need to kind of get it through my system, you know. And, and and it's funny, you know, when, you know, when I think about jealousy, um, I get kind of jealous of the land. I get jealous that the land gets to be bathed in sun and gets to, you know, be covered by, um, you know, undulating cloud and darkness. And, you know, I, it's, sometimes I kind of can't stand it, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah. And one thing that struck me in our conversations was the kind of personal parallel from your life and that you yourself had sort of been blown out to sea from Ireland to, mm -hmm. uh, well, from the countryside to the city and then from the city to New York City, the Uber city, and then this mm -hmm. kind of deep knowing that you had, that you needed to return, not to dub. I'm here, no. I'm here, my phone just got yeah, low power mode. Uh, but then you return, you ended up returning to your kind of ancestral home. Uh, and yeah. I wonder if you could talk briefly about how, how that's been, been for you. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's kind of, you know, I knew after the fact, like I applied for a residency at and Glen Arts Foundation, which I'm pointing to, it's up the street, um, you know, and came one year for a month, loved it, came back the next year and decided that I was moving here and then, uh, and then went back to New York, told everybody that I was moving and then it took four years for me to leave New York. But in those four years, I met um, Crystal Gandred, who, you know, and who I work with, who's really important part of my daily work. I met Stephen Corsano, um, who's another painter, uh, who's very important. And lots of, I got to have a few shows. I got to, you know, there was, there were a few things that happened, really important things that happened in those four years in New York. And then when I moved back here, um, it happened in, a, in good time. 
Um, and what it was, what it was before I came here was I had really wanted to concentrate a bit more on on a single strand of work and and find a continuity which I hadn't been finding in New York. I felt like I was constantly reacting to all all the new things that were happening all the time. And I was very prolific as a painter, but I felt like I was missing something and and now the work I'm doing now is, you know, I knew it was going to slow down. I didn't think it was going to slow down as much as it has. Um, this project I started in 2020 is, is nowhere, research project, nowhere near finished and may not be for the next five years. But in all honesty, I don't mind if it lasts the rest of my life because there is a continuity now in my work. It, one thing leads to the next and I feel like there's a development and I'm maybe getting somewhere. It probably has to do with the, my age as well, but I think um, it has a lot to do with here. There is a, uh, there is a sense of continuity here. Like you, you can look out at the hill, that hill that's in that painting, and and just feel the, um, the the human habitation, and then you can feel the formation of the land. And there's something really um, necessary about that for me uh, to to know the eternalness of things, um, to see that breadth, that length of time and know that it's nothing, you know. Um, I spend a lot of um, my research time in the 17th century and uh, just fascinated by the Boyle family, Robert Boyle and his sister, Lady Ranla, and um, just the plague of 1665. I was already reading about it before we had our own plague. So um, but I just, I, I feel like, Time, time is a big deal for me. You know, it just keeps moving around in circles. You know, and um, collapsing and increasing and collapsing again. So, does that did I answer what you? You sure did, and I. Uh, when I was I was just recording the audio book last week, and in the book I wrote the word ran a lot because one of the other artists. Maurice Bartali Stillman, one of the Raphaelite, pre-Raphaelites, <clears throat> had fallen in love with uh, the seventh Viscount Ranala, who was like some horrible mm. rake or whatever. And so they managed to not get her married to that guy. But I was like, how do you say that? <laughs> and so I like was on YouTube and watched this whole video about Robert Boyle and Lady Ranala, and I had not even connected that to your color work, which you'd been doing uh, these fabulous videos uh, over the, the pandemic. Is that his yeah. his writing on color that you were reading from? Yeah, yeah. He wrote a book called Experiments and Considerations Touching Colors. Actually, it was an amalgamation of writing because he was an experimenter. So he'd do all these experiments and he'd write them down and then he gathered them all together in a book in 1664. And uh, yeah, no, the language, um, as as has been said, he didn't believe in a full stop. So yeah, in a period, like he didn't, you know, they just don't exist. And there's capitals all over. These ramblings, he was known to be a rambler. His sentences would go on and on and on. Um, I'm very fond of him. I'm very fond of his writing. I find it grounds me. I keep the book on the table and um, just his curiosity. Um, and then his sister uh, is just uh, the most remarkable woman. She was uh, besieged in Athlone Castle for two years. She was married to, um, to, she was married to whatever he was of Athlone and besieged there for two years and then went over to England. They were born in um, Waterford. Um, now, and I just, now, you know, it's a little problematic, you know, the, um, their, their father was English and he came over and, you know, benefited from all that seizing of land from Irish people. So um, I've, I've just bought the book about uh, their father, just to kind of get, to dig a bit more into that. Um, but then isn't everything problematic these days? We have to look at race and identity and nativeness and uh, just, just take a good clear look at it and see what's happening. So. Yes, and when we do, we see that as you say, or, and as you depict in this painting, history is uh, doesn't go anywhere. It's undulating and collapsing in on itself. And 
re-emerging, reborn, swallowed by someone through someone else's beer, and then <laughs> reborn in our daily lives. And these old tales both tell on us and inform us as we as we continue to stumble on. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. It's been such an honor to speak with you. As always, I, I always learn so much, and uh, I, I, I'm beyond grateful that you uh, agreed to uh, be included in this book and even allowed us to do a detail of your work. It's on the book cover. It looks so incredible. Um, no, thank you. Thanks to you and Crystal and Susan. Yeah, I'm really appreciative. Uh, yeah. And hopefully there'll be many more collaborations. Yes. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Nula. Be be well. I uh, hope to see you soon. And uh, love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye. Everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you feel so inclined, check out my book. Look, 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 look again. Buddhist wisdom reflected in twenty six artists. It's out through Lionheart Press. Uh, Nula Clark is prominently featured. Uh, lift, lifting my quality of life right up through the roof. Um, thanks everyone for your attention and time. Warm regards to you all and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.